sitting with friends. <laughs> Hi. Holiday Aloha. <laughs> Wow, so spectacular. Hi. Randy. Ah. I wonder. Quebec party. <laughs> um. Ah, Canada. Hmm. I think it's all Canada. Okay. Yeah. Good to get to see you. Sweet job. Oh, so great. That's wonderful. <clears throat> okay, Steve, we're all set on the technical end. Whenever you want to start. I hope everyone <clears throat> is where they want to be or adjusting to where they are, finding, finding comfort within your body, and within the posture, sitting, standing, lying down. Uh, even if you get up to walk, that's fine. You can, you can practice all the postures. Even after many years, sometimes there's just a new way of suddenly dropping into the body and realizing sitting or standing, lying down, walking in an entirely new way, like from a new level of ease, new level of um, non-attachment or non-identification. Talking to a friend of 25 or 30 years yesterday, we're just remarking on how our bodies were 30 years ago. <laughs> and the, uh, the combination of that physical energy and enthusiasm. Uh, and at least at times it seemed easier to access certain degrees of concentration, or certain degrees of flow in practice, connecting with the posture from within the body and connecting with the breath from within the breath. And the extension of the body connecting with seeing from within the seeing process, not the object of sight within the hearing process, not always going out to sounds. And now all these decades later, sometimes things seem closer in and energies the energy sustainability, not always the same, but there's just a, a degree of satisfaction of being able to lean back on the training, all the decades of training so that um, we may not have the same degree of concentration we once had and we may miss it. But then there's the opportunity for that insight of 
of the missing and what's behind it in the identification or attachment to those easy, collected, concentrated states. And that if we're just a little patient and uh, the wisdom that's accumulated, aware of the uh, attachment or identification with the peaceful, concentrated states, that that insight immediately unblocks the building blocks of identification, the building blocks of self. And it's the wisdom that, that suddenly opens up, penetrates the barriers and relaxes into uh, an easy flow of wisdom and concentration together. As younger practitioners, we relied perhaps more on the concentration to bring the stability and tranquility for later intuitive insight moments. Uh, having done this practice, many of us for a long time, now we may often rely more on, on the accumulated understanding, insight understanding. And, and it's, it's fine as we often encourage you to um, use wise consideration, use wisdom reflection you know, to disconnect from the old habits toward identification and attachment and, uh, and realign with the, the, the current of the, the natural concentration we've built up over years and realign with the aim here is the, the, the peace through wisdom, the peace through intuitive awakening and to use the available energy we have and the conditions of the body we have. So sitting or standing, even lying down may not feel as fluid and flowing as it once did, but this is what we have. And, and exactly what we're experiencing right now is our tool of, of awakening right up to our last breath. Every moment of physical ease or discomfort, of pain or pleasure, using wise reflection to remind ourselves that if we have mindfulness, everything is okay. You know, it's okay what the body is going through, whatever process it might be going through. And to reflect on the, the cause of mindfulness, uh, something, <clears throat> something real, a felt sense experience to be mindful of, thus the body sensations are the moment to moment arising of feelings, pleasant, happy, painful, unhappy, or that ease between pleasant and unpleasant. And we have, we have this extraordinary mind to investigate what is the quality of the mind right now? What's the mood? What's the attitude of our mind? How are we approaching this inhalation of breath or rising of the abdomen? These sensations in the body, these mental moods and emotions that are appearing the exploration of the mind, to be mindful of the difference between the thoughts of narratives, 
and mindful of thinking itself as a process is the difference between what isn't felt experience. We, we can't feel a concept. We can't feel the narrative in the mind, the story about experience. We can only experience that thinking is happening or th this emotion of kindness and care or sorrow, grief is there all the way down to the very refined moments of knowing. We have the, the, the realm of physicality, we have the, the realm of feelings, always there, always available to teach us the nature of existence. We have the mind with its thoughts and memories, planning, expansiveness, contraction, and those fleeting moments of knowing. And lastly, we we have all the other all other experience that arises for us. All the ways we investigate an emotion as it's felt through the body, all the ways we experience the sense store, knowing of visual landscapes and sounds, fragrance, flavors. Sometimes it feels like we're just slipping in between the way our mind interrupts the stream of ease, the stream of concentrated and stabilized collectedness. And we slip in between with this, this knowing wisdom that we have. And it's like a realization, oh, okay, there's this discomfort. I wish it wasn't there, but that's just a thought. Discomfort is there. Feeling is here. And what's it like? There's nothing we need to hold on to that we need to frame and figure out. The rhythm of our system is following its own nature. So the, the more we encourage ourselves or our whole system to lean back in the moment relax and just feel the various processes, the bod bodily pulsations, the sensations felt within the, the breathing or respiratory process. Neurological, energetic streams we can feel from head to toe. We don't need to label anything. We don't need to elaborate on anything. As if whatever arises is, is a reminder or a mirror to just be still, to know to see as it is.
Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> I think there must be something of a uh, nostalgia in the air that <laughs> I don't know if it's, you know, the, the time of year or New Year's coming up, but I also had a um, conversation uh, with a friend recently uh, from high school and um, she got in touch because we were going to have this spring our um, 25th high school reunion which I hadn't really done the math in a while and it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a jolt um, but we were thinking of doing like some kind of presentation you know you can you can offer to do some sort of presentation to, you know, your members of your class or other folks. And whether it's in Zoom or on per, in person, um, we had the thought of doing something around our, the ways in which our spiritual lives and our um, vocations have kind of coalesced and where the roots of that might've been during our high school years. <clears throat> And so it has gotten me thinking about, you know, some times gone by in that way and the, the power of, I don't know, those times. And one of the things that was so kind of surprising to me was just that re reflect, her reflecting back to me how there was just something I didn't remember uh, about her. And um, just that we were in our, we were so in our worlds and I don't really totally trust my memory uh, in general, but certainly of high school. But, but there was something about that that felt really true that I had this, I have this sense of like, that my whole world felt so dense. It just like my mind, it felt, everything felt very dense and kind of visceral and, um, all of the things I cared about or were upset about or confused about, or it just felt so like existential every kind of moment of it. And, um, the pressure of that density of mind, the, the painfulness of that, not just of the fact of unpleasant experiences or not always getting what we want and the kind of classical dukkha things, but there was something I just do feel like I remember very viscerally of um, just wanting some escape from that, wanting to be able to get out of the pressure and, and intensity of me. And, um, and then the layers of like from that within my body, but also like the kind of condition we were in there at school and the society and just these sort of layers of kind of boxes and, and pressure systems that felt like, um, I was in and not having a lot of tools really at that point, you know, to, um, to try to understand. I remember being drawn to um, like Wicca, uh, you know, kind of like pagan um, spirituality. Just, I think it was books I read. There was a friend who was kind of more steeped in that. Um, you know, it's Western Massachusetts out there. So there's all kinds of just witches in the woods of Vermont and all that. It was really wonderful. And I, I think it, it first gave me that first sort of sense of like, that you could have a relationship with the unseen forces around you and with nature. And um, there didn't have to feel like the sort of wall that there was entry into that and that that offered a kind of expanse, offered a kind of sense of um, space, right? Spaciousness and room to breathe. Um, as limited as it, as it might have been for me there and my, my ability to kind of deepen in that and really in any way. But I remember the consequences of that too. Of, I think I had like a little pentagram necklace that I wore. And I remember at some point, my teacher pulling me aside and saying that she was concerned because um, someone had stolen a skull from the science department 
and there was like a growing sense amongst the teachers <laughs> that it was me who, who had done it. And um, she didn't think it was and assumed it wasn't and it wasn't, I swear. Uh, but she felt, she, she, she wanted to convey to me that sense of like, this is everything you do matters. <laughs> and every little sort of like variation on like the theme, you know, of like not going with the mainstream, which you're clearly gonna keep doing, like that's gonna have consequences. And this exact, some pattern here is gonna keep happening. And you should just be aware of that and be careful of it and have understand where it affects you, you know? And at that age, of course, it just made me more angry and kind of entrenched. Um, but, you know, anyway, outdoors, music, you know, um, whatever I could do to sort of feel like I could get outside of, that there was that sort of dialectic, you'd get outside and then the sort of the pressures would crank back in, you know, it's like, oh, the more I felt like I got some space. And, and I think I was looking for a kind of power outside of the normal, a power outside of the littleness of what it felt like I was absorbed in and confined by. And uh, the second year of, of school, I, I found that you could, um, instead of doing sports, you could do community service which they don't like publicize, you know, they want you to like do sports. And, um, but anyway, I found my way to this organic farm nearby where I would go in the afternoons um, and uh, met these two people who would be really kind of my first real mentors in life, uh, Wally and Juanita Nelson. Sometimes Andrew's not here. Sometimes a guy named Andrew comes on and he, he was very close with them as well. And um, they, they lived a, a very different life than really still most anyone I've met. Um, they had a very small little plot of land that they didn't own. It was granted to them through a kind of nonprofit organization indefinitely. And they had no running water, no electricity and made very little money. You know, they had a, a kind of small bean patch, uh, garden patch. This is up in Deerfield, Massachusetts, uh, at a Quaker center there. And they exuded this quietude and this peacefulness and a sense of just profound, um, lack of agitation with the choices they had made and the life, the life that they were living together. And um, they cared a lot about the world. You know, they were very, a big, a big part of their commitment was to be poor enough to not have to pay taxes because um, they felt that so much, such a, such a great degree of our income tax goes to military spending. They had been pacifists for many years and, and finally were able to, to find a way that they felt they weren't contributing to violence in the world in that way. And it was a, such a different, it was such a refuge for me to be able to go there after school and work and talk to them and uh, have conversations and also be in the garden and be on the land and um, watch the seasons come and go there was a kind of space that it gave me, a kind of peace that I became aware of that also didn't necessarily require escaping, um, right? It wasn't like I had to get out of my mind or get out of my body or, uh, you know, get out of where I was. Of course, this place, it was a place away from, um, you know, there was something about a, as a refuge, as a place in their presence. But there was also something about just the the cultivation of a livelihood mostly around ethics, right? That around sila, if you think about the Buddhist path of sila, samadhi, panya, the um, ethical conduct, concentration, wisdom, or you know, ethical conduct, uh, mind cultivation, generosity, you know, these, these forces that um, 
that support us that like just one of them can be such a powerful path and for them it really was the the ethic of simplicity and not harming that guided everything in their lives um that it, that enabled them to have a peace within what the world within what they were doing uh within their interactions with other people um that was very compelling, you know, very inspiring. And I, I can't imagine what, what would have happened to my life if I hadn't had this sort of example of people who had really tried to live with such integrity in their lives and were living in such simple way uh, that was very quiet and very profound, um, but also very meaningful, you know, and that their goodness was so palpable, but also not... Um, broadcast you know it wasn't loud it wasn't very active it wasn't like they were making a big organization or doing a big thing in the world it was very small and simple and quiet actually i realize i have a um it's going to share screen that's why in Juanita. that was in the 40s way before i knew them And this is them in uh, later in life. <laughs> and then this is this is mostly when I knew them around around this age. They've both passed away at this point. I won't say too much more about them. You know, I've, I've written about them in other places and, you know, they've, um, the, a lot of ways in which they impacted my life. And they weren't, um, they weren't Buddhists, you know, they weren't Quakers. They would often say, we're not Quakers, but a lot of our friends are friends. Uh, and they, they didn't really have a method. It was just simplicity was their method, you know, and, kindness and generosity and um they were not i guess when it was more when wally had passed away but juanita was not like that interested in meditation you know when i started getting into it or and uh, andrew uh who was also very close with them was a meditator but it for me it was um it was very helpful to start to get a sense of a practice outside of just life choices and outside of just the um, carefulness we try to take with our actions um, that might help lead to a similar sense of, of quietude and integrity and um, connection with our goodness. And I think, you know, of all the things that one could or I, we could talk about in terms of like, similarities or where these places are related. I do think that the, the what I wanted to bring in today mostly was just, I think something that can be lost in the efforts to uh, practice so much these days, uh, wherever, I don't know, the West or Asia, or, I mean, I think it's very kind of pronounced because of modernity is that practice can start to feel very busy too, right? That there's this idea that it's like inner work, right? We call it work and there's a agenda that you have and there's like an anxiety around progress and around um, getting something done and doing something that just is really so absent from the Buddhist teaching And a flavor that was so palpable in terms of Wally and Juanita's life that I think drew me also to this practice of like 
that there's actually a way to the sacred, a way to goodness, a way to integrity and um, the cultivation of the, these beautiful qualities in ourselves and, and in the world that's, that's actually quiet, that's settled, that's calm, that's not creating more agitation, more striving, more tension, more density, right? Again, going back to like this experience of like what was such a relief to be with them and what I feel like is such a relief in practice. It's a lot of what really Steve was offering in terms of the instructions today of like, you can get, maybe it is youth that wraps us up in striving or, you know, the energy that might be there naturally that you use it in a way that's, um, you know, of benefit to the practice for sure. But I think it's also, you know, beyond that and this like whatever tendencies we have to be in the world and to, to who we are and what we want to do and what we want to accomplish and whatever, that that translates into some actually unhelpful skills internally. And that there's a way of just like sitting and watching <laughs> and getting out of the way, really. It's like watching the entanglements and watching the untangling, watching the entanglements and watching the untangling and not feeling like you have to bring in like this sense of uh, like electricity, you know, kind of lightning energy to it. Wally and Juanita, I mean, they, they barely use, they had some kerosene lamps, they had some candles, but, you know, people would offer like, oh, we could put solar panels. They were like totally suspicious of solar power and of wind power. And they were like, it's, it's fine, it's better. You know, you're not using coal and you're not burning all these things, but like, it, you're, it's like humans are always gonna try to find a way to, to avoid the actual work of the wanting of more energy, <laughs> the wanting of more power. And the answer isn't in finding like the sort of magical, perfect source of endless power. It's like letting go of the need of that, right? It's like being okay in the dark, right? Being okay with the simplicity of, of that lifestyle that they lived. And I think that similar, there's something similar in that ethic that's available to us in our practice and available to us now in the winter you know, this darkness that's that's here, that's pervasive and um, how beautiful it is, how quiet the invitation is and how rare it is to take up that invitation. You know, even in the holidays, it's like people get so busy and a lot of it's for beautiful things and trying to, you know, care for each other and gifts and family. And um, But I do, I think, hope that I and wonder if this season because of COVID and the aspiration to have, you know, less travel, less um, busyness, more simplicity might also be an invitation to, to just allow for the quietude, allow for the darkness, not always need um, the agitation that we associate with life, with being, with existence, right? And we, we feel like there's something essential and good in that. And we forget the dukkha in that. We forget the, the, the pressure and the density and the tension, um, except for we feel it. Of course we feel it, but we, we don't, we forget somehow that the way out of it is, is through it quietly. Not that we need to escape it or, or find a way to override it with more pleasant experiences. This neighborhood here is very, very, very dark at night. Um, and um, last week I was inspired or driven or something <laughs> to um, buy like a ton of Christmas lights and wrap this tree um, out there in them. And it's it's pretty awesome. It's just like, you, there's there's nothing like it around here. So it's like, you can see it from probably at least a half a mile away for sure, if not further. Um, and it's in a, it's in a spot that's pretty visible to the, you know, it's a, it's a quiet sort of area, but um, there's this sort of beaconness to it um, that feels great. And I feel like happy and it makes me feel joy. And I feel like there's something about, of course, the season and um, the holidays that, that is about sort of like uh, offering these things of beauty and sharing and that sense of joy from whatever tradition, you know, whether it's 
Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or any other, you know, this um, this sense of that we are in the solstice time and this powerful relationship between between darkness and light. So I, I feel good about it. It feels happy. It feels like there's some appreciation. There's probably some complaints as well out there. But um, but I also really notice of like just the energy it takes, right? Like plugging it in every night. It's like, there's like a, it's just, it requires that kind of intensity just requires juice. It requires this, the, the electricity. And um, while there is a value to that and I value it and, and enjoy that part of the season, I also really value the, the brightness that this practice brings that's very different. I think that there's something so important about like the, the quietude of Vipassana, the simplicity of it, the letting things dissolve, letting things be, watching the, the ending, let not, not, because all of this tension, all of the pressure, all of the tightness in the mind is coming out of the mind's attempt at creating solidity, right? Everything is changing. Everything's undependable. Everything is arising and passing based on conditions, internally, externally, the mind, the body. And so the mind gets anxious just to create stability. You know, it doesn't always have to be about anything. It's like, oh, why am I anxious? What's this feeling like? And trying to think, oh, is it this? Am I worried about this? It's like, maybe, maybe not. It's like the mind, the heart is doing it to feel solid, right? It's like the tension makes us feel real, makes us feel solid, even if it's painful and horrible. Our views, our opinions, you know, it's like this, this idea of it's not just greed and wanting that creates solidity or aversion, anger, anxiety, fear that creates solidity. It's our ideas, our perspective, our views that we keep rehearsing, you know, about the world. Oh, this is this way. This is that way. This is that way. You know, it's like, it's not whether they're right or wrong. It's that need to create meanness rightness, solidity, stability, and how painful that is to the mind. You know, that we use, you know, we, we use ignorance to create stability. It's amazing, you know, not just Americans. Everyone does that. It's like very intense to watch. And so it's like, okay, Where's the, where's the letting go of that? Where is this like, where's the relief and the loosening? And maybe things feeling less clear, less solid, less stable, but also like the relief that might come from that, the quietude, the darkness in that. Also, of course, the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, uh, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, these things can start to create a sense of stability too. It's part of what their design is as concentration practices. Oh, there's a sense of like, wah, 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 wah. You know, you're, you're putting out those Christmas lights into the ether, you know? And there's a beauty in that. There's a goodness in that. Sometimes we can also see that there's a, a compulsion there. It's like, we don't feel safe in the, the non-existence. And so we try to love, we try to, we try to do these things out of a motivation even to control, to keep asserting ourselves. It's okay, of course, we do that. And that's part of the method, part of the process, part of the um, part of what we go through. But also remembering that in like the deepest level of the teachings, there is this unconditioned reality, right? The place where things don't even arise and pass, where um, consciousness doesn't even come into formation. This, this deep place of paradox of that's on one hand is actually the darkest, quietest, and also the source of the most brilliant, um, most clear. And so this relationship between light and dark and the seasons, it's like, it's not only metaphorical and it's not only about balance or one kind of in this sort of dialectical oppositional kind of thing between each other. It's also just to recognize that the, that that quality of light is only available through that quality of darkness. The 
And there's a place where the Buddha says, in the Bahia Sutta, where water, earth, fire, and wind have no footing, there the stars do not shine, the sun is not visible, and the moon does not appear, darkness is not found. And when a sage, a sage through wisdom, has known this for themselves, from form and formless, from bliss and pain, they are freed. So um, I think I just wanted to offer this, this remembrance that on one hand, there's something so powerful about this time of year in which this sort of goodness within us is called forth. And we have the ability to share in that sense of generosity and kindness and compassion and um, joy, you know, all these beautiful qualities. And, and it's important to celebrate our goodness, the goodness of uh, the world. And where do we give ourselves the time and space to be quiet? And not quiet in a way where it's like, oh, we're, we're adding in our enlightenment to the baking and the cleaning and the presents and like all these things, like these projects that we're trying to accomplish. Where do we give it a really different space? Even if it's informal, just like that quietude of just sitting and doing nothing for a little while bearing the, the restless energies that might arise. We could just sit, have a cup of tea, not distract ourselves, not be productive of actions or of ourselves. Look out the window, watch the snow, watch the trees, watch a bird, watch a pet, whatever, you know, the sense of where might we start to block off times and protect our ability to access the, the deepest potential of the season for ourselves and for the world. I'll be it for the offering today. But if anyone has any um, questions about your practice, about the instructions, about your, the talk, um, Steve and I'd be happy to, to take some time to answer um, any that might arise. You can see how Molly has raised her little Zoom hand. If you wanna do that, um, you have to go down to click on the participants button on the bottom little thing will arise on the right-hand side with everyone's name. And at the bottom there, there should be a little button that says raise hand. Um, if, if you can't find that, you can always type something into the chat and we'll remember to call on you. There's another little button on the bottom about the chat. Or you can wave your hand vigorously and maybe there'll, someone will see you. Sometimes it's a little hard to see across the screens. Okay, Molly. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for your Dharma talk and for the guided meditation. Um, trying to switch gears. Um, so last week, what you said, Jesse, was helpful in clarifying about metta and the using the phrases and the radiating. Um, and I've been confused, and some of that relates to what you've just talked about. Um, the radiating feels really comfortable to me. Um, and, but I'm confused because at some point, I don't know, you or someone gave a Dharma talk where it's like there's combining the sense doors with meta practice with the, with the Brahma Vihara practices. And there was a like folding it into the heart and receiving. And, and so, that sort of gets me into this conceptual place of like, you know, which sense door was that one? And what's, what's this one? Um, 
So I'm confused. Great. Yeah, Steve, is it all right if I start just to answer the, yeah. I'm, I think the most important thing is to feel like if you feel like you have an approach that works, then it's like, don't worry about whatever other sort of methods or tools or things we might offer to kind of like help support in general, right? It's like, it's like if you feel like sitting there and kind of radiating the sense of goodwill works and that you can connect and you can sustain it for some period of time and you know that of course it won't last and but you can kind of get into it with that you know that's really great and pure and and actually essentially what the buddha taught was that then you have like several hundred years later the kind of putting on to written text a variety of methods that were sort of developed over time for people who have just different compositions you know we're all different in our different ways in terms of practice and in terms of what works for us and and how we might find a connection to care that we can stabilize and build over time and expand over time and so then you just enter this other world of like method where the traditional phrases, you know, and you start with yourself and then you go to a benefactor and then you go to an easy person and then a neutral person and then a difficult person and then all beings, you know, that's like this sort of classic framework. That's wonderful, right? It's like, a, it's, you, you can see how well it functions across so many lines of like trying to go and start with it where it's easy and develop it into the sort of more challenging an expansive way over time. But that doesn't work for everyone either, right? That method for a variety of reasons. And so we'll offer different methods as well. So the, the six sense door meditation kind of option that you could do with any Brahma Vihara, right? With the loving kindness or with equanimity is the sense of trying to serve for some people, it can help have a sense of integration with the Vipassana practice where you're not just sort of tuning into love and kind of excluding your direct experience, but that you're hearing sounds and you're feeling a tenderness toward them. You're noticing sensations in the body, you're feeling a tenderness toward them. You're noticing seeing, you, you attune to that tenderness towards them. There is a little bit of a different dance there in terms of where it's Vipassana and where it's loving kindness. So instead of investigating all oh, the sounds and the nature of arising and passing and the pressure and tension, tightness, instead of like so much investigation, that is the more Vipassana quality of mindfulness that develops in Vipassana, you're just sort of attuning to the tenderness of like, oh, caring for body, caring for sound, caring for sight. And there's a way in which you, the object is still really the caring right? Or th that's the, the force that you keep coming kind of back to, but it's through different entry points. And the idea is ultimately that you can have a sense of embodied tenderness and, and loving kindness that doesn't have to feel conceptual at all. It's, you're not conjuring the notion of somebody. You're not saying, oh, may this person be safe or may all these beings be safe. You're trying to sort of just have the sense of care for body as it arises, sound as it arises, sense experience as it arises. And it's a way of, of doing metta that way. You can also do metta in the directions, right? All beings in this direction, all being in that directions or in categories or, you know, there's so many different methods mm -hmm. and it's worth exploring different ones. So I do feel like it's good that we offer different things. But on the other hand, if you feel like you've got a thing that works, like there's no reason to complicate it or like undermine it by using other approaches. Well, I think what you said really helped me understand it better. Mm. <laughs> like doing, Vipass doing it with Vipassana and doing it with the Brahma Viharas. And so thank you. Great, yeah. And, I, and that was like with last week's guided meditation. I mean, I just feel like there's, again, it's part of this quietude thing of like, sometimes the, the metta can feel like a lot of work because it's like, oh, okay, you're this person and may you be that. It's like, it can just feel busy versus like, you can just tune into caring. Hypothetically, one can. <laughs> it's not always easy. It's not always accessible to everyone, but like that that's possible. Just tune into caring and feel it. And the sense of radiating it or not, you know, it doesn't have to be more method or, or complex than that. Yeah. Great.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Quinn. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I, I want to thank you for having um, been so articulate to express what I've always felt for years, this uh, trying to resist against the pressure to, to shop, to bake, to clean the house, to decorate the house. For years, uh, this painful pressure that I want to resist, and then in the end, always succumb to it, uh, to this like manic frenzy. Uh, but I think as I'm older and uh, maybe my practice is deeper, uh, I'm able to find some balance. Um, oh, oh, still participating in the joy, but uh, not succumbing to the commercial pressure. Also, um, when I saw that photo that showed the sign that like, have not paid taxes since 1981. It gave me a chuckle because uh, I'm reminded of a certain political figure who don't pay taxes, and uh, but with different ethics, different agenda. So thank you for a very delightful talk. Great, yeah, since 1948 even, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know, Steve, <laughs> I, I, I feel like there's something about that that you were really speaking to about the restfulness that's come with like the non-agitation of having less energy and the beauty of that. I don't know if you want to offer anything in response to Quinn's question. But... Uh, the image that comes to mind when you, when you say that is um, when I, when I was first in Upper Burma in the late 70s, um, the Sagain area where we have our fusion retreats, you had to either take an ox cart or a boat upriver to, to get to the north part of the Sagain Hills uh, or walk. And, and I noticed I noticed in, in those days, I even brought one back years and years ago, those uh, really finely polished sticks, polished because people wore them on their shoulders uh, for years and years with, with buckets of, of water, rice or whatever on the end. And uh, so eventually I got to know some of these people uh, and they'd go from the river, for example, the Irrawaddy to get their water and walk back to Wachet village. And, and sometimes I would see them and greet them. And I, they had a real style of lifting, keeping their back straight and then bending their knees and their hips in just the right way, not to torque their body and set it down. And then stand back up straight. Um, it was with such grace. At the same time, I could see that they had put down their burden, you know, and uh, uh, and and felt relief, felt release from the chore, and um, and a release from the weight that they had on themselves. So that's the image that came when Quinn, you were saying, it's a it's kind of a joy not to feel that frenzied energy to do, to do, to perform. Instead that there's a beauty and a grace in, in just being and doing nothing with full commitment. What comes out of that is magical. <laughs>